Welcome everybody to Philosophy 2600, Ethics and Science. My name is Adam Briggle, and uh, I've been teaching this class for, gosh, 10 years now, and it's one of my old time favorites. With me to help me navigate and be my technical assistant is Admiral Akbar. You gotta know that I'm a big Star Wars fan. In fact, I think about science, uh, I think about science fiction a lot and ethics and science and uh, kind of our moral imaginations, how they're exercised in science fiction scenarios. And I really like Admiral Akbar and the cool ship that he flies. Of course, he's on the side of the good guys. So he's here, he's my uh, technical helper and he'll be chiming in on the class as we go through this journey, this odyssey of learning together. I really hope that you get a lot out of it. This course hopefully changes your life for the better and you know you learn some cool stuff at the very least so this introductory lecture is pretty traditional i just want to walk you through the class a little bit try to motivate uh, why i think it's so important and uh, you know just give you some basics so yeah here's what we're going to do uh, a little bit to try to say why this is i think uh, an essential class for anybody to take, whether you're thinking of a, of a career in the sciences or not. Um, I'm gonna give you preliminaries about the way I approach this class because people teach ethics and science in different ways, as you might imagine. I have a very capacious, a very broad approach to it. I just want you to be aware of that. Tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll go into some of the nuts and bolts about the class at the end here. So, I was trying to think why this matters. There's so many ways to say this. There's so many reasons it matters. So I just tried this one. Science is the defining feature of the age that we live in, I think. Thinking critically about science then is an obligation that we all have, that we're all gonna have to do. We, and we use that term loosely, um, as a global, globalizing, homogenizing right, society, have put the dynamic process of studying and controlling nature, that is science, at the very heart of our way of being. Not all cultures in all times have done this or do this, but the culture we participate in, the one that's bringing you this lecture via Zoom, right, does this. We're a scientific civilization. And that means we live by an ethical commitment to science that we be, believe basically that it's good in itself and that it will liberate and enrich and lengthen our lives. So it's worth thinking about the ethical commitment. It's what we call progress and we kind of expect progress or we call it development maybe or modernization. But of course, we're also aware of the dark sides underneath this and how they're connected to science as well. So this is the big, big picture that I think about this class in and why it's important for everybody to take this odyssey with me. So this is basically a study on how we live. You know, that's the, that's the biggest uh, framing of it. Okay, let's give you some specifics though. What do you mean we're a scientific culture? Well, think about what we teach in schools, public school system in particular, right? Everybody learns science, there's such an emphasis on STEM careers and STEM professions. But from the moment you walk into an elementary school, you are getting scientific knowledge um, thrown at you. And as a result of that, the beliefs you've got in your head about reality, about what exists, how it works, why it's here, so much of that is the testimony of of scientists across the ages that have been distilled in textbooks and other media that you've absorbed as your basic understanding of the world. What do we give public money to? A lot of science and private money, to, right? Um, who's empowered to advise us on public policy? Scientific experts. What drives innovation and economic growth? Arguably the defining features of our late modern capitalist globalizing techno industrial order. It's all based on science. Military power is ultimately a arms race, isn't it? 
in science and secrets that different sides have and how we're going to now weaponize outer space, for example. We're going to have enhancements for our soldiers that allow them to stay alert longer. It's always looking for that scientific edge. Medicine, healthcare, big pharma, and the cost of all of this, right, tied in with science, with a research and development enterprise. Think about changes in media. Right now, what I'm doing with you, but of course, social media, the communication, the political ramifications of this. This is all scientific research and development. Uh, think about science in the environmental arena, both in terms of assessing and diagnosing problems, but also how science can feed into environmental problems. And the grand question about living sustainably on a planet, whether we can solve that one, is going to be something that hinges a lot on science. And then finally, on my sort of top 10 list of what it means to live in scientific culture and that's what, and why it's important to think about ethics and science, is it is informing our imaginations of the future. I've got a couple of young kids and every movie we watch is shot through with the scientific imaginary about who we might be, who we might become, what our futures might hold. Uh, it's there, it's woven into our culture. Uh, where I come from, I, I mostly am interested, if you think topically uh, along that list, in environmental issues. And I'm really m mostly passionate, right now I'm teaching another course, for example, on climate change, really passionate about scientific issues as they take shape in the environmental arena. So you might see uh, a lot of that in this class, and that's just sort of my own personal stamp on it, but I hope you'll see across the board how ethics and science is so important. I put this image up also because the development of the telescope uh, by Galileo is arguably the most important marker of the modern age that we live in, as it gives us this sort of Archimedean standpoint in a way to see Earth as not a unique, special center of the universe, but rather one sort of floating ball amongst all these other objects that are all obeying the same universal laws. So another thing about science is how it gives us this worldview about what reality is and our place in that reality. Okay, like I said, here's some preliminaries, how I approach the class. A couple of categories. Again, I wanna be very broad, open-minded, big picture in this class. I want to get you thinking big ideas. Um, and in order to enable that, I want us to see that science isn't limited to just science, it's inevitably meshed in with technology. So you might as well just say techno-science. And ethics isn't just limited to like the personal private sphere, it's inevitably meshed in with politics. So we might just say ethics politics. These are the two hybrids. So it's an ethic politics in science technology class. And then I'll have a couple slides just on where are we in time now and space? Who's doing science? And I think that's something we'll, we'll wanna keep just sociologically, empirically. What is science? Who's doing it? And how is this shifting global dynamics of power, knowledge power around the planet? So just a teaser on that, just to get us a little bit on the map. Okay, so the first one, it's my cheesy, <laughs> my, you know, PowerPoint gives you this icon, you type in science, it gives you a bubbling beaker. So there you go. Science is techno science. Here's my cheesy technology thing. It gives you a little computer with the internet symbol on it. Um, I think it's common to think of technology as applied science. You know, the technology, the Romans, when they built the aqueducts, weren't necessarily being very scientific in that engineering project. You know, they overbuilt them if they would have had a bit more of a precise systematic understanding of natural laws, they probably would have used a lot less stone. But it was a big engineering project. Nowadays, engineering technology is thoroughly saturated with scientific knowledge. And so, yeah, technology is applied science. But I think what's less appreciated is science is also applied technology. You know, again, I'm talking about climate change. How do we know stuff about climate? So much we know from computer models, right? So the science is an application of the technology. Or we know from satellite data. Again, our knowledge is coming from technology. So I, these two are so fused together. This, for example, 
is theoretical physics. <laughs> it's harder to think of a bigger material techno footprint for the ethereal abstractions of theoretical physics. So if that's the case, I subject to you that we can't do ethics and science somehow divorced from technology. We've got to see the tangles and the intertwining of these spheres. My other hybrid, ethics and politics. So if you take politics just to mean processes and institutions for deciding who gets what, when, and how, you automatically see this is about ethics. Who should get what, when, and how? What is justice in those cases, right, when we get together politically? So yeah, I, th I see ethics as crossing into public policy, as crossing into politics. We can't have some sort of barrier that, that just keeps us out of that because it's too controversial or something. We need to go there, I think, in this class. We need to go there with open minds, with critical uh, inquiry, willingness to learn, but we need to go there. Um, okay, so that's my sort of techno science, ethics, politics, hybrids. I don't think I'm gonna click on this link, it's in the slides. Uh, it's just to say that we are in this moment of exponential growth when it comes to science, research and development. This is just one stat, 90% of the scientists who ever lived are alive today. We'll get into this later, but science was the purview of the elite few who lived on the margins of society and didn't really want to get too involved with society because they probably get their heads chopped off, right? Those days are gone. We now have a very thoroughly scientific culture. And as a result, we see this explosion of, of not just scientists, but of scientific knowledge being produced. Uh, here you go. Now this isn't scientific knowledge, but this, the, this sort of tracks with it. We have so much information. I mean, talk about a knowledge society is another way to say scientific civilization. I was astounded by some of these figures. 474,000 tweets every minute. 69 million Instagram posts. That's crazy. Um, that's the world we're in. It's an information society. Another good reason to start thinking about science. What's the relationship between data, information, knowledge, meaning, and all of that with politics and media? That's the sort of questions I want us to get at. And this course can only just kind of stir them up for you and help you organize them. Last one on where are we? This is a fascinating chart. It's showing who is funding research and development. Uh, on the left column, you'll see on the y-axis, researchers per thousand uh, employment. So the higher you are, like Israel, ISR on the very right top, they have the most scientists or researchers per capita for their population, right? Then you have on the right axis, the x-axis going left to right, the gross domestic uh, expenditures in R&D as a percent of GDP. So how much money relative to the economic size of these countries are they spending on R&D, research and development, which is like science and technology, kind of. Well, you see again, Israel leading the way Korea, Japan, Sweden. Then the third metric is the size of the bubble. And that's just, uh, I believe that's overall how much money is being plugged into research and development. And so the bigger the bubble, the bigger R&D footprint. And you see the biggest one is the USA, but look at China, CHN towards the bottom there coming to be basically the world's largest producer of scientific knowledge. Um, you can still see per capita, they're very low in terms of researchers. And as a percentage of their GDP, they're not spending as much as the US say. But as an overall investment, because it's such a big country, they're putting a lot in R&D. So this is just another one metric to keep track of is who's spending money on research and development. And what does this have to do with geopolitics and all of the ethical issues tied in with that? So given you have a taste now of how big this is, this course, my job is to curate it, filtering the signals from the noise, and to provide you with maps or tools, or let's call it frameworks, structure, 
so that you can organize this fire hose of information, that you can give it some structure to help you systematically think it through on your own. My job's not to tell you what to think or what to believe. It's just to try to help you on your own path of thinking. Okay, a bit about me. Um, I love to write. Um, and so these are some of my, my books. I'm a professor at UNT. I've been here since uh, 2009. And like I said, I've been teaching this course pretty much that whole time. Uh, in one of those books, Ethics and Science, you're going to be using in this class. I'm hoping to update that and revise it, but I still think it's a good foundation. And then these lectures and the readings will bring it more up to date. Um, so yeah, th that's some of my stuff. You can Google me. Also, so last thing, looking at the uh, course, you can, you can look at the syllabus. I encourage you to do that. It's on Canvas. Have a good look at that. These learning objectives are in there, basically. I know many of you haven't had a course either in ethics or necessarily in science. Certainly not the two put together. So I'd be happy if you came away with some understanding of the basic concepts in ethics and the ethical norms in science and a little bit of how they developed. And I'd be happy if you walked away with a greater ability to interpret, analyze, and assess the issues that come up at the intersections of science and society, ethics and politics and technology. And throughout the course, of course, uh, obviously we're gonna work on improving our reading and our critical thinking skills as well. I think that's a vital service provided by higher education. And I hope this course helps you hone those skills. Uh, if this is in the syllabus, what do you have to do? Keep up with the readings or the videos that I assign, the lectures, Take notes on those because the quizzes will come straight out of all of that stuff. There's no surprises and you can use your notes. You can go through the lectures. It's all an open book. You know, so if you put in the time and effort, you should do just fine on those quizzes. The other two thirds, one third the midterm, one third the final, very similar as well. No surprises. You should have plenty of time to do that. Again, if you need accommodations on that, let me know. Uh, I'm not here to judge how fast you can take a test. I really want you to have time to reflect and absorb the material we're gonna cover. So that's that, hit me up if you've got questions. I also created a voluntary discussion board, no obligation to post there. I just wanted to have an option to create some intellectual community. And I'll try to remember to post there as well too. And maybe we can get a discussion going on issues pertinent to the class. Last thing I wanna do, just walk you through the structure of the course. First thing we're gonna do after this introduction is kind of bracket off ethics and say, what the heck is ethics? And then we're gonna look at science and say, what is science in particular? What are the norms involved in science, the values involved in science? Then we're gonna put science in the context um, as a practice. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about the society of science and the norms that are guiding and the rules that guide that, and then we're going to put science in society. So I see it as a course that kind of builds outward. We isolate our key terms. We look at science as a practice in itself. And then we situate science within the dynamics of a broader society. And at every level, we're looking at how ethics and science interrelate. Um, and here I just have, so where you'll find that modules two and three, science and ethics, the inner core, and then four and five will be the Society of Science, and then six and seven will be these broader issues about science in, in policy in a democracy. So that's about that. Up next, we're going to have another uh, lecture, just getting ideas going in an introductory fashion with some case studies and distilling some key themes that we're going to see traced throughout the entire course. So with uh, Admiral Akbar, I am Adam, signing off. I hope you have a good one. And may the force be with you.